it uh, throughout the day. Um, we have, uh, first we're going to have Abby, uh, Abby Nesman, who is the Director of the uh, Public Safety Program at CCLA. And she's going to be talking about a research project that looks at the end point of, uh, of uh, what, what types of consequences can, um, and impacts uh, individuals can uh, experience um, once, once law enforcement has gathered all their information, uh, set up a criminal record about them. Um, you know, they can try or have to try to run the system, and now they're trying to find a job, and uh, their employer wants to conduct a, 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 a police record check, so, um, or a criminal record check. So she's going to be talking about a research project but in depth into what the private sector is doing uh, in that context. And then we have uh, Chris Parsons, who's a postdoctoral fellow at the Citizen Lab here at the Monk Center at the University of Toronto. <laughs> and uh, he's looking at the other end of the of the, um, the information flow uh, uh, ecosystem. He's going to be looking at how information is going from social networking sites to law enforcement databases. Um, and I'm just, because we're short on time, I'm going to be very brief and just pass it along to Abby to start. Thank you. Um, so I've heard police background police record checks come up a couple times uh, between last night and today, which is great. This has been a topic um, that for us has been a real focus for a couple of years now. And it's being driven by people. And this is not something that when I graduated from law school, I said, oh, let me look at police records checks. This is fascinating. Um, this is a project that's really driven by people contacting our office. Um, and experiencing the, the negative impacts of the information that the police are releasing. And so this is one of the people, and this is Lois, and I, I use Lois because I have her picture. I have many other people who do not want to be identified, but Lois has been bringing that to be out in public. And you may have heard that I heard that she knew the papers a little while ago, because this is Lois's um, criminal record, not that she's ever been accused of committing a crime. She phoned the family phone 911 when she attempted suicide several years ago. And then this information ended up in the seat and then it ended up at um, actually the US border and where she was questioned about it and denied entry. So I'm not going to talk about the border issues, um, although we could. Uh, I'm going to talk about all the other places that this information ends up based primarily on consent. The border stuff that flows, you don't have control over that. The US just has access to that border. And all of the other places that this information comes up, and it comes up more often um, in employment contexts, volunteer contexts, adoption, custody battles, it comes up in school placements, universities are now asking for criminal records checks upon entry to certain programs, and by the time you get to third year in nursing or personal support worker and faculties, you have to submit it to a criminal records check. So all of these people are um, being required to hand over this information, theoretically based on consent, but really in situations where they don't feel they have a choice. And, and legally, they really don't you know, provide this or don't get a job, provide this or drop out of school. And, and some people that contact us have lost jobs, have dropped out of school. So this is this is the human um, background that is spurring this research. Um, I thought I'd give a bit more information on what is a criminal records check, uh, because it, it's not obvious. And so the term criminal record, you would think that it, it was criminal convictions within this definition of when you are um, found guilty of an offense and sentenced or fined after a criminal trial, you get a criminal conviction. So that's the one on the very uh, left over here. You can also get an absolute or conditional discharge. That's still a finding of guilt. So you'll still have gone through a criminal process. So they'll say, yeah, yeah we, we find you guilty, but we're going to discharge you. And there's pretty strong statutory protection, actually. And those records are supposed to effectively disappear after one or two years. They're automatically purged from CPIC. And those are explicitly addressed in legislation. And then we have all of the everything else, all of the yellow and green. And the vast majority of those have no strong legal regulation. So convictions, you can get a pardon or a record suspension. You can apply for that, and then that record will be sealed. And your employer can't get that, except in very narrow circumstances. And as an additional discharges, those are automatically sealed. All this other stuff, with the exception of diversions, 
is not explicitly addressed as much as legislation. And this is the stuff that's following people around on their records checks. So if you were charged with an offense, but it never went to trial, they can disclose that on your record check. And you were uh, suspected, someone alleged something, but they never actually charged you for finding that, so you have to disclose on your record check. Mental health apprehensions, if they apprehended you under the mental health act and took you to the hospital, 911 calls, and victim and witness information, we have found instances where that has been disclosed on a police records check in the volunteer context. So all of this information is in police databases, and when people are consenting to these records checks, very frequently, they have no idea that this information is going to come back on their record. There's no legal regulation for the most part, and it's extremely hard to try and claw that information back once it ends up on your record. So what is a criminal records check then? This is also a difficult question, um, because again, there's no strong legal definition, and different police forces use different terms. They are all doing it in an ad hoc way, and, and I can try to describe the situation across the country, but really it's summed up by you have to ask the individual police force what they think they're releasing, what they think a criminal records check is to actually get a good handle on this. The first level, we could say these are you know, imprecise terms because they change, but first level could be criminal records check. You might could ask convictions. Sometimes they release um, uh, the discharges in the one three year period. That's, that's the really formal, you, you've been found guilty of something. And um, there are some police forces uh, that no longer provide that level of records check. So British Columbia right now has um, guidelines where they say we won't even do the standard criminal records check. We only do the more privacy invasive records checks. So the middle category, um, police records check or police background check, um, that's where they start to release a wide swath of non-conviction information and police contact information. It varies depending on who receives that check, where they think you're going, what they think is relevant. And so some of the interviews that I've done this year, um, so there's one particular um, staff person in Edmonton who cared greatly about protecting vulnerable clients in the vulnerable sector and would put everything on. You know, if she thought it might be relevant, if she thought that you, um, the fact that you had been um, a complainant in a domestic violence incident, um, and then maybe your abusive partner was going to show up at your volunteer placement in order to continue the abuse, she thought that was relevant um, for the agency to know, as it would disclose that you had been the victim of a domestic violence, or at least alleged that someone had committed domestic violence against you. And so it's, it's very ad hoc, very all over the place. There are some provincial guidelines, but there's no strong legislation with perhaps the exception of BZ. And then the vulnerable sector check. So this is the actual check that is supposed to be aimed at um, people who are working with the vulnerable sector. It is codified in the Criminal Records Act, um, but only to the extent that it allows for some party offenses to be unsealed. So some sexual offenses or violent offenses, if you got pardoned, um, that protection will fall away. For, for the vulnerable sector check. But again, it doesn't address what, all the other stuff, all the non-conviction stuff, who includes that, what it's included, that's also all over the place. And so in 2012, we looked at this in, in our report and called Presumption of Guilt. We looked specifically at Alberta. We tried to see what were the police forces doing, what were they disclosing. We found it was all over the place. It was prejudicing people, and we made a bunch of recommendations aimed at the police services. And so we said, uh, you should not be releasing this information. Bring your practices in line with the intent of the law. Um, and maybe you can have a very narrow exception for really, you know, someone has a whole bunch of allegations of child molestation and they want to supervise children alone. You know, maybe that's a circumstance where you can release it. But really, just don't release all this stuff. So the police came back to us, and we've continued talking with police, and I've had some um, really great successes actually in Ontario this year with police. And so the police came back to us, and this was their answer. Uh, for the most part, this is not a core policing function. We're not doing this in the name of, you know, normally we, we, we like to protect our community, but we're not doing this because there's a specific risk to public safety. We're doing this as a community service because there's a demand. People are consenting, they want access to this information, the community is demanding this information, we happen to hold it 
but really this is not correct reasoning. This is just some really ancient engineering here. here. Um, so this year, what um, I've been focusing on, in addition to continuing to work with the police, is the private sector. And uh, so this is, you know, this is theoretically what happens. The police are collecting information from people, about people, and then the person is applying to the police and saying, please give me a record of the information you have on me. And if we start to add the private sector, it gets much more complicated. So here we have the requesting organization. And requesting organization is not actually the person. It's not actually the applicant who wants this information, right? I mean, maybe some people do. Um, but it's actually the requesting organization. It's the volunteer person. It's the school. It's the employer. So they are requiring the applicant to get it, and they also go straight to the police services to get it. So they run the procedures with the consent of the applicant. And um, so that's one private sector player. There's also companies. And this is um, a growing industry in Canada of selling criminal record check services. So you have a, a, a nice little sector um, in Canada, much, much, much larger in the U.S., who are actively promoting uh, records checks, actively selling services, and doing um, a mediating information exchange. So they are interfacing with the requesting organization. They are selling the saying, hey, did you guys know that you should be records checking all of your employees, that you should be records checking all your volunteers? Um, we'll do that for you. We'll help you with that. Um, they get consents from the individual applicants. Individual applicants can also request that these services be provided in the police station. Uh, they work with police services. So one of these companies is actually embedded in the Halifax Police Service. They um, have arrangements with the police service to help them fulfill the demand for records checks. Because this is becoming an overwhelming demand on police services to try and keep up with these requests. They also, though, um, have contracts with individual police services. So it's usually a very small police service. When the private company gets the requests, they funnel all those requests to a police service to fulfill them. So there are police services that are being and, and then during the research this year, they've also added court records checks. So they sometimes now skip the police entirely and can go straight to the provincial court records, which are extremely detailed um, privacy concerns that they say, well, the employer is responsible for confirming the need, um, and so we just fulfill that need if they say it's legal. So this is um, this is the basic theme that we wanted to look at in more depth. And so we went out and we uh, conducted a lot of interviews, usually with not-for-profits. Um, because they tend to be serving the vulnerable populations. They also tend to be more willing to talk to me than <laughs> the private sector and the records check companies. Um, and the key questions that I wanted answered were, why are you asking for this information? What's driving the growth of this industry? And what are we doing with this information? How are we making decisions? And, and how are we taking into account both privacy and human rights obligations and when we're dealing with this transition? So our interviews and research show that this is definitely a growing field. And I can talk a bit about what's driving the growth. And we can really divide it into the for-profit and non-profit sectors. And in the non-profit sector, the 1990s, uh, there, was, there was huge growth and awareness about sexual abuse, institutional sexual abuse of children. Um, There's an incredible number of Supreme Court cases um, on organizational liability for sexual abuse. There was a concerted effort by large organizations that organized the volunteer sector to go out and educate um, the volunteer sector about their obligations towards their vulnerable clients. And this resulted in organizations starting to records check. And once they started to records check, um, privacy and human rights wasn't really a part of that message yet. It is now, but in the 90s it wasn't. Um, and once they started to realize that they should be records checking and they started to think about liability, this has a snowball effect. Um, so that was a real driver in the not-for-profit sector. In the for-profit sector, it's harder to figure out, um, but all of the research that I've done points to the United States. Um, so in the United States, 40 years ago, almost nobody was doing records checks. Today, 97%, oh, sorry, 93% of U.S. Employer, employers use records checks, and 73% uh, of them records check every single employee. 
and it's a four billion dollar private industry, and this is just private companies who facilitate this task. And it really they point to 9/11, um, perhaps unsurprisingly, as the um, key growth factor in the records check industry. Immediately after 9/11, there was a raft of legislation that the U.S. passed requiring criminal records checks for all kinds of industries, and um, companies saw you know, five times growth in demand for their services in the five months that followed um, the 9 11 talks. So Canada um, has been slower. It also doesn't have the same legal. There's negligent hiring laws in the states that have made it up to Canada that make it a liability if you don't do records checks in the states. We don't have the same legislative and legal framework, but you know these things filter through best practices in terms of human resources, companies looking for new markets. They, they come up. And now increasingly, um, the government, you'll see it in the government documents where they publish their HR practices, they say records checking your employees is a best practice in terms of HR. And so these norms filter up. Specifically, um, what we're hearing from people is, is this. Almost everybody these days are requiring a records check. It's getting to be pretty accepted practice. My understanding is that at the school right now, even the parents who have to go on a day trip have been cleared and approved. Um, that's true for some school boards. If you're a parent and you want to accompany your child to the field trip, you need to provide your clear, vulnerable sector check to the principal before you will be able to do that. So um, people who have been involved in domestic abuse situations are not allowed to go with their children on a field trip, depending on how the principal views that particular record. Um, especially the schools also have to renew your criminal clearance once every six months in some situations. So, um, not only do you have to do this, you have to do it again and again and again. Um, other things we heard um, in terms of who within an organization is being required to submit this, um, especially in the nonprofit sector, it's a blanket approach. So everybody, because it's just too hard, they're risk averse, it's too hard to figure out who should be required to submit these searches and who shouldn't. So just everybody, right? Just across the board, send them to us. Private sector is more nuanced. They're more aware of the privacy and human rights legislation that applies to them. <coughs> not-for-profit sector, 46,000 not-for-profits in Ontario. Um, half of them have no paid staff. So really, it's high turnover and not a lot of professionalism for many of these people. Uh, privacy concerns justifying privacy invasions. Um, there's a million things that we pull out, but I thought this would be interesting for you guys. You have done such a good job of making people aware of how they should treat private information that that is now a regular theme coming in to justify why they need to criminal records check everybody. So even if you don't have any contact with the local sector, even if you don't have any control over financial management, you don't, you're not in a position of power, but you have access to confidential information. And so I need to protect that confidential information with my clients, therefore I records check my employees and my volunteers, because privacy is really important. Um, so this came across in both the not-for-profit sector as well as the for-profit sector. Um, but often, you know, hearing a lot of personal information. And so we want to make sure that the people we have in place are going to appropriately treat that personal information with the confidentiality it deserves. Um, if you look at the government regulations, about, um, especially at the federal level, who needs to have security clearance, it is based on access to private information, personal information, um, including very low levels of private and personal information. That security clearance is requiring criminal records checks. So what are organizations doing with this information? This is one of my favorite interviews. Um, it is not a representative interview. But um, this person sees a criminal record check as a predictive tool, regardless of what it is, if they wanted to work with children, I wouldn't let them in. Um, what about a DUI? This is a common um, entry that many people sort of dismiss. You know, that's a DUI, we understand that it's not molestation of children. This person says, well, if it was 20 years ago, maybe I'd let them in, but you know, if it was last year, I'd say you no, know, come back in five years, and then they probably never come back, and that's good. Um, and then they ask, well, they're not driving, and they're not working with kids. These are people who are stopping envelopes. Um, what are you worried about? And the answer is, well, if they bring a law, they might bring policy, and you know, they'll show up drunk and do something weird with the paperwork. Um, 
And so when we get into conversations about how people are using these records, and this is an extreme response, but the level of thought that's gone in and about why this is relevant and why people need this is generally very low. And there are a lot of assumptions about what these records say about the types of people and the reliability of people that are coming in. Mental health records, so those 911 calls, those mental health apprehensions, and people generally view this as a red flag, and they are less willing to employ people and, or take people on if there's a mental health medication. Um, and even when confronted with the reality that human rights legislation applies, privacy legislation applies, you shouldn't even be asking this, they say, well, we just wouldn't want to take that risk. And so very, very low tolerance. Um, so according to the Corporation of Privacy and Human Rights, organizations are risk averse. Um, most of them are quite surprised that human rights is even relevant. Uh, and privacy officers, um, the managers of volunteers, says the privacy officer should not be concerned about privacy because their job is to protect the volunteer and to protect very vulnerable clients. This is largely a non for profit section. Um, so then this is the basic question. Is this a justifiable invasion of privacy? Right? Because it could be justifiable. If we're actually concerned about protecting people and this is a good way of protecting them, maybe this information, even though it's not being used in the best way, is relevant. Social science evidence says no. In the employment context, criminal records are not predictive of your likelihood to commit an employment-related offense. And we can go even further in terms of the mental health records. And when you look at non-conviction records, um, there is just no evidence that this is at all relevant or predictive or um, in any way related to a person's ability to do a job. And the impact of, and one of the reasons this is the case is because the impact of giving someone employment is incredibly powerful in terms of preventing reoffending if they have a criminal record. And so by just giving someone a job, you have all of a sudden drastically reduced the risk that they will recommit a criminal offense if they commit one in the past. It does make sense to look at legal obligations. I will not get into them with you, but um, in Canada, there just isn't a strong case that people are legally obliged to criminal records check their employees on a broad scale. Um, there are all kinds of things that are thrown out in the interviews. Um, when you trace those down, they just don't follow through in the Canadian legal context. Um, I'm out of time. I could talk about the third party records checkers. They are driving this market. They are actively voting up companies and not for profits and saying, you know, do you know that you need our services? We will first assess, we will assess your current practices, we will tell you where they're working, and then we will sell you um, the services that you require to get your practices up to snap, right? I think it's a bit of a conflict of interest, but people didn't agree with that. Um, Privacy and transparency, they are, ask, they are accessing um, non-conviction records at times uh, indirectly through intermediaries, but they are providing access to um, the non-conviction information as well. And most of them have privacy policies that we could find, not all of them. And most of them will tell you if you get consent forms, which are hard to get, they're not publicly available, what databases they're searching, but really it's very grand. Um, south of the border is a whole different scenario. They have sold their information from their court systems in bulk to the private um, background checkers. It's, it's very different. It's way more concerning um, than what's happening here. That hasn't happened to date. So the big picture, expanding demand for highly privacy intrusive background checks. And um, premise on consent, but in situations where people have you know, real ability to uh, say no. Um, the information is used to make relevant discriminatory decisions in a wide variety of contexts. And uh, the individual impact is that you have multiple recurring disclosures of private information, volunteers on the question on the mental health history or allegations that were made against them multiple times every time they apply to a job or volunteer prospect. And, and on a societal level, this is intensely counterproductive. It's sort of putting up nice barriers for people that don't need to be there. And if you do have a record and everybody's criminal records checking that, um, reinforces the marginalization of people in our society. And so our recommendations, uh, that police always want to put this back in the private sector. 
and say, well, private tech, you don't need this. Just don't ask for this information. You're the one who's asking. You are the ones who should hold this back. I don't think it's um, possible to tell the private sector to voluntarily ramp this down. There are risk averse. Um, we need laws, including better privacy laws that apply to employment situations across Canada, which we don't have right now, better human rights laws that actually address non-conviction records, which we don't have right now, um, and better laws governing the release of non-conviction and mental health information on police background checks, which we also don't have right now. And um, so that um, is something that we're working towards uh, getting in place. Um, British Columbia has an interesting legislation. If anyone is interested, I'd be happy to talk about that a bit more. So uh, the project that um, I was involved with, with Colin Bennett and uh, Molnar, uh, was eventually titled, to know what we thought was a cashier name, the Cassie Project, the Aid Access to Social Media Information Project. Um, a lot of the work that I do, that Dada does, that Colin does, uh, starts with doing really boring methodological things like asking questions to people very directly, and then seeing how, how they comply. So what we found is that there is incredible inconsistency in accessing information from social networking services, which is a surprise. But it's not just for individuals. Law enforcement also faces substantive variances in their ability to access records. And so what I'm going to do in this brief presentation is first give you sort of an overview of what we did, some methodologies we really undertook, and then talk about how subscribers could or couldn't get access to information, just our story, what happened when you actually exercised your process rates in this country. Then I'm going to go and talk about what we discovered from doing interviews with law enforcement. So we spoke with uh, officers across Canada. Um, what they do, how do they need the social media information? What are the policies that they're training their fellow officers on or that they themselves are trained on? And then I'm going to indicate giving it away. There are huge inconsistencies in access. Um, and then I was going to show a really cool tech demo that uh, the system allows it developing, um, show Cassie's moving forward, but instead I'm going to explain that, what that cool demo looks like. <laughs> <laughs> So the Cascade Project, we looked at the top 23 social networks that are used in Canada. So we went and looked at market data. Uh, we also applied some non-common sense to adopt to pick up some of them. So as an example, um, we included Apple's Ping user service, which no one that I know has ever used. <laughs> but if you have iTunes, you had Ping. And so we just wanted to go and get a nice large selection of what happens if you ask these companies. So not only did we ask them questions, and of our personal data, please, but we also did content analyses and privacy policies in terms of services relevant. Um, we also developed a, a 60 or 70 page document that does a comparative analysis of all of these social networking services and privacy policies. Rank them. It doesn't rank them. This is what company A says, company B says, company C says. We went through sort of highlights sort of questions. You know, how do you deal with financial information? How do you find personal information? Do you have rules for your children? Do you recognize the Canadian law? You know, all the things you sort of hope to see in a privacy policy. Uh, as I mentioned, we spoke with law enforcement, but we also looked at the available law enforcement compliance guides. So but that's what, I don't think we found anything that was kind of specific. We, we were sort of given a document, the download about how Google tends to work with Canadian law enforcement, it wasn't an official document. But there are American leaked versions of you know, some of the 2006 to today. Um, and then the broader end piece, which I won't talk about this presentation, time is this week we said, okay, so this is how individuals can get access to their information. This is how authorities today 
can access your information. What would be the implication of lawful access for that piece of legislation passed? Would it change any function? So in terms of companies that we look at, I'll, I'll slide if you here. They're very pretty and colorful uh, uh, <laughs> logos. But we look at Blogger, Club Penguin, Facebook and Flickr, Foursquare, Google Plus. Um, we looked at Instagram, previous being acquired by Facebook. LinkedIn, LiveJournal, Meetup.com, MySpace, Nexopia, Ping, Pinterest, Plenty of Friends, uh, which is a dating website that's popular in DC. Reddit, Tumblr, uh, Twitter, Wikipedia, which sort of awkwardly fits what we want to see anyways. <laughs> WordPress.com and WordPress.org. So this was, if there was a variance between the self-installed side of the company, do they have one kind of rules to deal with law enforcement versus the commercial side? So to WordPress.com blog. World of Warcraft, which I would just encourage you to read their wealth access guide because it's hilarious. Um, YouTube and Zia. So in terms of subscriber access, we only targeted companies that we have the existing business relationship with. So under Canada, if a company has a real substantial connection to Canada, you can request your personal information. So we contacted Facebook, Tumblr, LiveJournal, Twitter, Instagram, Google, Apple, and their ping service, Flickr, and WordPress. Uh, there were two mechanisms that we used to access data. One was we developed uh, letters, just sent them along when we could. And when we couldn't do that, we would use checkout services that were available. Um, there were very few companies to provide any kind of checkout service. Um, as you would be, I'm sure, shocked. The responses were poor and vastly inconsistent. So, who actually provided any data whatsoever? Facebook, Twitter, Google. <coughs> Every one of them has a, has a checkout or a near checkout code. So, a checkout service is you know, your Facebook user download all your stuff. Google offers the same thing. Twitter has a, has a challenge mechanism where you have to provide a whole bunch of personal information so they can confirm it's you asking for the data, and then they send you a, a, a list. So we also contacted Apple and Instagram. Apple was the most curious company to deal with because the only information they had with me was my customer service information. When I had warranty claims, they had no app information. They had no pay information. They had Apple is devoid of all information apparently, um, <coughs> short of warranty information, or at least that's what they were willing to buy us. Case of Instagram, um, they had no mechanism in place, but I, I, and we did get a full record of all we have. But they did an excellent job. What they did is under the you can negotiate work back and forth so that you get the data that you're asking about yourself. We're asking for time data you hold, how long, and so forth. And we actually got a file. It was if we follow a subpoena on Instagram for our data, this is what we would have got. And so it became incredibly revealing. Just how much information um, can be available with everything from every person you know, every person that's trying to follow you, that you follow, with the IT when you signed up. Loads and loads of information. So they did a very good job with those resources. Um, LinkedIn began the process and then fell off the face of the earth. Um, the single worst company that provided a response without any doubt was Tumblr. We explained to them that they are obligated to provide a response. They respond with, no, we don't. We're an American company. We don't have any people in, in Canada. We do not comply with Canadian law. We're done. We call in a response saying, well, actually, you do. And you know, we explain it more depth. And the follow-up response uh, was, we appreciate your interest in engaging in legal discussions on our position stance. So if you're Tumblr user, they really care. <laughs> and then we had no responses from a bunch of companies. LiveJournal, nothing. Yahoo, nothing. WordPress, nothing. And again, even when there were responses, any response was good, but better than no response. But in every case that we got down, there was no meta data. It was attached. So, I mean, this is where I was getting, so I don't need to go through the, the song and dance, why meta data matters, and what it can be. But there is nothing there. So in the case of a uh, uh, great demonstration example, uh, in the case of uh, <coughs> Twitter, we got all of, I got all the records of every tweet uh, 
uh, embarrassingly sad in my life. <laughs> I, I, and every six years, there's a litany of embarrassment. <laughs> and so there are five lines about each tweet. You get that. Compared to every time you send a tweet, there's around 60 or 70 lines down. Now, some of that is compressed. So, you know, there's a few lines that say, well, maybe this line has two pieces in it. But regardless, you're missing the majority of what's actually going on. And significantly, we know that these companies are advertising companies. We know that they use likes to monitor people's things around the internet. In the case of Facebook, as an example, there is no information about that. All of the data that was on Earth in Facebook versus Europe, all of the really rich, nitty gritty, super embarrassing data that Shrems got, we did not get. And so these checkout services, which are to be applauded, because they exist in the first place. That's the only way we really got that. So, thumbs up, I guess. It doesn't work. It's not effective. It doesn't provide full understanding of what's collected. And as a result, as a consumer, you can't actually know all the data that's being collected or how to So, in terms of individuals, you can talk, and there are mechanisms we have in place, and they are robust on paper, in theory. But when it comes time to application, there are substantive weaknesses. <laughs> Plus, of individuals access information. It's sort of sad. But it gets worse. Because when you actually go and integrate the terms of service, you might say, OK, I want to get it. But the Roach Motel is, is full, and I'm done here. And what we found is there are not only inconsistent subscriber access processes, surprising, but also, perhaps unsurprisingly, there are incredibly inconsistent subscriber deletion processes. So uh, this is Colin sort of thought this up because he was feeling pithy and feeling annoyed. Um, and so here's the way that we sort of classify it. Companies will engage in deletion, not yet. Sometime. Sometimes they'll say 30 days, 90 days, the future. On the backup page, you delete it. You don't know. Deletion. But only for what we deem personally, personally identifiable. And sometimes that's very endless. So sometimes it includes IP information, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it includes credit card information. It doesn't always. <laughs> the variance in what constitutes personally, personally identifiable information is different all across the case. If you look at the full casting report, you'll see variances every company. Deletion, but not information your friends have said or shared with you. So if you're on Facebook, someone's liked it or they've reshared it or anything like that. I'm sorry, that's their personal information. You can't, you can't do anything about it. Deletion, but only for us and not for others. So Facebook has the often regarded as a gentleman's agreement. That's sort of a very masculine, bro-y culture. So Catherine Laws, who has written a brilliant book, um, speaks to how developers that hook into your data, they're just regarded as good folks because they're engineers. The engineers do the right thing. So she has some really revealing excellent quotations where there was a policy that Facebook said that they ran, and there was a technical API at one point they indicated that they were using, but it was more of a general secret than anything else. So we will delete your data, but anyone else who's grabbing your data from us, we can't do anything about that. In an app world, that matters. Uh, deletion, but we need to cover our legal acts. So that means that it may be suppressed, may be hidden, but uh, I believe it was Live Journal in particular said, you know, we will provide, we will delete, except for legal reasons, some other reasons, et cetera. And I'm not joking, but I'm not saying et cetera, because I don't know what the word is. That's in their privacy policy, et cetera. So for all the lawyers in the room, because I think there might be one, how would you define et cetera for a deletion process? We will, unless et cetera. Um, deletion, but we can't guarantee erasure. Of course, this is the Canadian situation of Exopia. I'm sure we think we should delete, but we're not going to because we can. There's a series of other companies that have similar uh, uh, guarantees, if you will. Um, and also forgetting but not the third-party analytics. So except for the analytics companies themselves, i.e. Twitter, Google, and Facebook, every one of these companies have third-party trackers on their sites. So of course, even if you pull out the one motel that you're in, all the analytic information is still going to be there. Usually, with only we may share information with third parties, and 
and kind of not May, I check with GoStream, and indeed, it was not May. So things are really peachy for individuals accessing information, and if you have a law, the application is challenged. Moreover, if you try and remove consent, if you try and encourage them to delete, it's just variable. But how do the police get access to your information? You as a citizen have issues, have to they serve it. So to Abby touched on, open source intelligence is something that's used. Um, we actually found a lot of officers don't play it, because they don't trust it. And then in Canada, there's of course the back and forth with subscriber data, what is it voluntarily provided or not, um, and, and other kinds of content that they want to access. But what are the actual mechanisms that they're using right now to get access to both subscriber data and content in particular? One thing that we found we just did is clever. Um, is they use self-download features, the check of systems. So let's say you're in a situation where you've been assaulted, and the police know it's going to be horrible to try and get information on Facebook or something. Well, if you've been assaulted, they ask you to download all your Facebook information and help to prove that you were assaulted or something like that, or that you were cyberbullied. And so the check of mechanisms are being used by some police as a way of collecting evidence because they know the warning system, the court system, is going to be useful, or they perceive them that way. The second is many people that you're going to be employed with, they use uh, the letters or uh, which is, can you please turn over information? Um, and if not, subscriber data, telecommunications companies are experts in handling these. But similar letters are issued to social networking companies. Hey, we have a real case, can you help us out? There's court orders, I'll get to the seriousness of court orders and MLATs. And the last part is mutual legal assistance treaty. So if it's a serious crime, and they know it's not mutual legal assistance documents almost immediately. But the court order and the MLAT process is confused in the case of Facebook in the very least and possibly other companies as well. So currently the way things work in British Columbia where we did the research on was let's say you know something's going on in Facebook. You get a court order from a BC justice. You then serve it on Facebook, right? Yeah. What you do is you contact a friend in Toronto or somewhere else in Ontario, ask them to file on your behalf. It then goes into what I take and call a cop book. And this is where Facebook will take up the order, put it in their back end database. It looks we have been told very much like Facebook book for cops. Like things, trying to accelerate your uh, your filing and all that sort of information. And then a Facebook security entity will allow whether or not they want to provide that information or not. So you, you have had court oversight. You know, this isn't like just give up the data. But it's totally outside the MLAT process. And it's been designed that way because Facebook doesn't want to deal with it. And the only time it goes to MLAT is if Facebook pushes back really hard. The key thing is, most police officers that we spoke with said, don't fight with Facebook because they don't have to provide the service to us. So if they take it away, we'll have to go through the MLAT. So we're just going to work with them to develop this. I would also point out for anyone who isn't a lawyer that just because it's a DC judge giving you a warrant doesn't mean it's a DC warrant and it doesn't get to go inside the boundaries of DC. So basically, we're saying we only recognize things that are coming out of Toronto. I mean, out of Ontario. It seems curious. <laughs> but even then, there's huge variances in what the police can get. What you get from Facebook is different from Twitter. Twitter, what they're always said, is it's a court order, it's about the timeline. Go to Craigslist, you can just <coughs> write on the back of an envelope if they don't hand it The handbooks exhibit strong variance. The way that police authorities are engaging with companies has high variance. And what the police are doing in response, at least some of you spoke to, is they're developing private databases that are outside of that HM, they say, they think. And they're encouraging people to make training to who did you talk to, or what company, what did you say, what was your storyline, what was the attack? So they can develop a centralized private pool of how you engage with these companies. Ideally, we are told this in a way that is not subject to public inquiry. So we have inconsistency in every way possible. Individuals having consistent access, 
Department law, law enforcement agents have inconsistent access to social media information. And ultimately, most consumers have no clue what's going on. And so I'll just end with what Cassidy tried to do to help with that, and where Andrew Hiltz, who is looking out at his phone and driving at the moment, of the great work he's doing at the lab right now. So Cassidy Project, we broke down all of our, our huge tables of data. We tried to present it in an as accessible way as we could do as social scientists with no mobile design capabilities. Uh, we worked with good designers. I think it looks pretty, but I'm not saying it's the best way of presenting large volumes of information. So if you go to Cassidy, C-A-T-S-M-I dot C-A, you can see what we've done. Which I'm very happy that we did. I'm proud that we did. But Andrew has taken it to the next level. So the lab we run something called Asia Chats. We're analyzing censorship and privacy on chat applications used by Asian companies, uh, used in Asia. He has turned in, he has created a really beautiful mobile environment. So you can see the icon pop various companies. You can click it, and then you can start just scrolling through questions. They it just, it, it's a gorgeous, helpful, nice way that's mobile friendly, whereas our website is very heavy, it's desktop centered, which means it's really not the way that most people browse. So uh, once that comes out, uh, I would just encourage you to go to this lab website because it's really, really cool and, and Andrew's just doing fabulous work. Um, and, and sorry, just one last thing because I, I realized I required a few contracts. Our research has been funded by the Social Science Research Council, <laughs> New Transparency Project, the Office of Press Commission of Canada, and most of the affairs, and their donors who declined to be made. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so thanks for the great presentation. A lot of insight. Sounds like there's a lot of room for um, uh, consi greater consistency, hopefully consistency in our and increased privacy. Uh, we don't have questions just because we're running a little bit behind, but both Abby and Chris will be happy to field any of your questions in person since I'm going to volunteer from you. So. <laughs> So just if we can ask them about the next panel, I've been told that their panelists uh, have a train to catch, and so we're actually going to be moving it earlier. Uh, it seems impossible, but as activists, we're used to doing the impossible. So the request is that if everybody wants to go and grab their team, come straight back in. The next panel will start in 90 seconds. So thank you. Sorry.